Welcome back! We're at part 7 in this series which exposes the true cause of the Gamergate fiasco and the people and organizations which were behind what happened. If you're new here, the previous segment, episode 6, is going to be prerequisite viewing to fully understand what I'm about to tell you, and the rest of the series is extra credit to understand their true in-game. So check out the playlist in the info box if you have an appetite for red bills. And Billy Boy, if you're watching, you might want to watch this on a toilet so you don't make a mess. Well, okay. Gates himself might not be watching, but I know damn well his goons are. Think I'm just paranoid? Check this out. Remember that clip in the last episode where I was proving that the $3.45 million grant which Kyle Orland's dad's organization got the day before the Gamers Are Dead articles came out, which was mysteriously miscategorized so that it was not listed in the North American category like it should have been? The clip where it showed that the date of the grant was specifically August 27th? Well. Coincidentally, they changed the entire layout of the grant site within a few hours after I released a video and now there are zero references to specific dates. It only shows the month that the grant was given now. Yeah, these fools literally went, shut it down, they know mode. I thought the Brookings Institute was a tech think tank. Well, now you're up against the Chan think tank, motherfuckers. Haven't you noobs even heard of the Streisand effect? How new are you? Suffice it to say. You know, I'm fucked up. Unfortunately though, while I had taken an archive of the grant itself, I forgot to take an archive of the search listings, which is where it showed the specific date. I failed at rule number one, archive everything. My bad. But I did, however, upload the original unadulterated screen cap so that you guys can download and save it for yourselves. The link for that's in the info box. Analyze it if you wish. And I know nothing about code, so I can't say whether it's even possible for me to have faked it, but I sure as hell no inspect element would do the trick. Bottom line now, we have evidence that the grant was given the day before the articles, August 27th, and you don't have any evidence to the contrary, Billy boy. You just dug yourself a hole and made it look worse for you. You should probably hire a new think tank, dude. Yours sucks. As an Anon on 8chan said, How nice of the Gates Foundation to update their grant search tool in the past 24 hours to allow sortable columns. Great feature, which just so happens to provide less information. So, do you guys still think the miscategorization of that grant was just a coincidence? Hmm. But let's move on to the real subject of this segment. In the last episode we talked about the Gamers Are Dead articles, but in reality these Gamers Are Dead articles were only a contingency plan. They were forced to go nuclear, as plan A had totally gone to shit. So what was their primary plan? Well, you might laugh at this because it sounds, it sounds utterly ridiculous at face value, but hear me out. <laughs> plan A? was the Ouya game console. <laughs> yeah, that pathetic failure of a console startup. Now, I'm not saying that the Ouya was necessarily originally founded by Julie Ehrman with subversive purposes in mind, for without evidence to the contrary, she might very well have been just a simple entrepreneur. We're still investigating that other angle though, but in reality, it really doesn't matter. What is important, however, is that the Ouya was shilled non-stop by the Games Journal Pro affiliates, so much so that it was ridiculous. It was claimed that the Ouya would revolutionize gaming, that it would let developers gain independence to tell the stories that they truly wanted to tell. It was not meant just to revolutionize the economic side of the gaming industry, but to revolutionize the content of the games themselves. And as a side note, the founder of the Ouya gave a keynote speech at XOXO in 2013. She's tight with the social justice clique. But when we take a look at the venture capital group, which was able to find a bunch of suckers and raise $50 million for Ouya, this should be cray. Today, gaming console and software company Ouya announced that they have closed a $15 million round led by Kleiner Perkins. And with anticipation from the Mayfield Fund, NVIDIA, Shasta Ventures, and Akan Partners. This marks one of the largest institutional investments to go to a project that had its humble beginnings on Kickstarter, along with the $15 million round, which brings Ouya final amount of funding to $23.5 million. The company will also be bringing KCPB, which is Kleiner Perkins, general partner Bing Gordon, onto the board of directors. Gordon brings with him years of experience from electronics arts. So, not only were Kleiner Perkins the ones that led the fundraising efforts, but 
Once they were successful, one of their top dogs was placed on the Uyo board of directors. But let's investigate further. Who else is a partner at Kleiner Perkins? Some dude you might have heard of before, Al Gore. And this is weird. Look who's a major member of the Brookings Institution. Al Gore's given what are essentially keynote speeches there on a couple occasions. Just look at these results. And let's be real. Al Gore is well known for being a scam artist. I mean, remember that time when he made that little propaganda film full of lies, which by the way was confirmed by United Kingdom courts, then coincidentally personally invested millions of dollars into founding a carbon credit exchange so that he would be set to make billions of dollars if his scaremongering was effective enough to become law, all while buying new waterfront mansions yet simultaneously claiming the water level is going to rise to destroy everything near the ocean in no time. Remember when he got blown the fuck out the first time he came at us with this scam after the climate gate scandal ruined his plans and the Copenhagen climate talks fell apart disastrously in 2009 and now he's trying to push it again? Remember that? But focusing back on Kleiner Perkins again, they had publicly admitted to pushing the fabricated H-1B crisis which we had already covered in the last segment. Check out this document which they use as propaganda for lobbying purposes in order to get other tech companies involved with the push. And if they'd push one fake crisis, what makes you think they wouldn't fake another? Especially when they think it can make them a lot of money in doing so. And it looks like there's some other Klein and Perkins partners who are members of the Brookings Institution. Why? It turns out that one of their partners, John Doerr, served on a Brookings Institution advisory board for quite some time. And to show how dedicated he was to the Brookings Institution, he donated $100,000 to them in 2006. And well, Gates is the biggest contributor of Brookings Institution, and that's a pretty solid connection between Gates and Kleisner Perkins. There's also a link I found between Kleiner Perkins and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Check out the Amazon Board of Directors. Two Kleiner Perkins partners serve on the board. John Doerr and William Gordon. And you might notice, that's the same John Doerr that was a major member of the advisement board for the Brookings Institution as far back in 2009 and donated $100,000 to them in 2006. They both work with the chief executive officer of Amazon, Patricia Q. Stonecipher. Let's take a look at her resume on Bloomberg Business. She is currently the senior advisor to the trustees at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. But it continues. She served as the chief executive officer of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation from 97 to 2008. She served as the president of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation from 97 to 2006 and served as its senior advisor from 2008 to 2012. From 97 to 99, she served as the president of the Gates Learning Foundation until it combined with the William H. Gates Foundation to form the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. From 88 to 97, she held various senior management positions at Microsoft. Microsoft Corporation, including Senior Vice President of Interactive Media Division and Senior Vice President of the Consumer Division. She served as a co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation from 97 to 2006. Ms. Stonecipher served as a chairwoman of the Gates Learning Foundation from 97 to 99. So let's get this straight. This chick was deep in the games and interactive media division at Microsoft and also played a major part in Gates' educational activities even when it was just a precursor to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. You could pretty much safely say that Miss Stone Cipher is Bill Gates' right hand woman, and she also has very close ties to the two major players at Kleiner Perkins on the Amazon board. What's more, one of the guys she is close with on the Amazon boards is also a major player in the Brookings Institution, which, as we know, is Gates' favorite tech think tank. But y'all know how I be up in this rabbit hole, baby. Turns out that Stone Cipher has been extremely close with Kleiner Perkins since at least the mid 90s. And how do we know that? Well, because Kleiner Perkins is actually the company that was fully responsible for raising the insane amounts of venture capital which made Amazon even possible. See, Amazon was founded in 1994, but after it was founded, Kleiner Perkins' job didn't stop there as they had a lot more funding to raise. They worked hand in hand with the entire process and Kleiner Perkins were extremely influential on who was to be placed in board positions. Stone Cipher got her spot on the board in just 1997 and has been on it ever since. This is actually the explanation for the reason why two Kleiner Perkins guys are still on the board today and have been since Amazon's founding. See, just to put this in perspective, Bill, you just got fucking wrecked. So 
With the help of the Brookings Institute and machinations to put their plans into effect, they fabricated the gamer diversity crisis. One of the institutions that played a key role in this was Polygon, which was coincidentally founded at the same time in 2012 that the Brookings Institution and the Kleiner Perkins were just starting to play up the fake H1B crisis. And also coincidentally, Polygon admitted that Microsoft paid them $750,000 for them to make a self filating document documentary about Polygon that was budgeted at only 75000 Hmm, and also in a strange coincidence, Feminist Frequency, which came online in 2009 and had originally nothing to do with video games, all of a sudden decided to focus pretty much solely on video games at the exact time the fake H1B plan was being put into effect, which we have evidence of. In the last video, we saw that the plan which was crafted by the Brookings Institution involved using newly created nonprofits to push their H1B agenda, but in this case, they vetted a fledgling player in an attempt to appear organic. They knew that if they created something totally fresh, us gamers would see right through it. Just as everyone saw straight through the fake H1B nonprofits that were being used to push the manufactured crisis. And although the feminist frequency wasn't a nonprofit at the time, they became one soon and they served the purpose well. With the help of Josh and his puppet Sark, they had effectively fabricated the diversity crisis, which was being pushed hard by the Game Journal Pro affiliates, and especially Polygon, whose ties to Microsoft have been mentioned already. But the key here is that the diversity crisis had become a media tirade and the Ouya was supposed to be the messiah to ride in and save the world. But they didn't expect that the Ouya would actually take over the gaming market or that anyone would throw their Xboxes and Playstations away. Their goal was to simply have the Ouya be at least marginally successful enough to create a niche market where it could at least survive. So why did the Brookings Institution care if a shitty console takes hold in the market? Well. The whole point of the Ouya, remember, was to allow developers to create the games and stories that they want to tell. The real push of the Ouya was to change the developer landscape. The goal was to create an indie subsection of the mainstream gaming industry, where indie titles could be flaunted as something that represents the true gamer. As we all know, places like Polygon chilled crap like Gone Home as if it was the next coming of Jesus. Brookings Institution plan was to have the Games Journal pros shill these non-traditional games non-stop. Not because they expected hardcore gamers to actually play them, but because this is all about public perception of the industry. And as we all know, public perception can be skewed by media reporting to make anything seem like reality. An easy example of media skewing perception of reality would be how they made it seem like everyone wanted a Ouya. And we can all remember that time when Saddam Hussein was behind September 11th and had weapons of mass destruction. Thank God he's dead. Iraq is in way better hands now. But back on topic, this is about packaging this up to sell it to lawmakers. They don't care about what you or I think or if we complain on a hashtag. However, in their wildest dreams, they never thought that any stupid gamers would actually put all the pieces of their puzzle together. Good thing I don't play games. I just rage against the machine. But exposing them has the capacity to truly throw a monkey wrench in their plans, which they've invested billions in. Which is why we see them going to such lengths as changing their whole grants website to hide specific dates. <laughs> Good one. Also, they keep tabs on us hanging out on 8chan. I wish I got paid for that. But I digress. Even if the Ouya was only marginally successful, the journalists could shill the non-conventional indie games non-stop into the outsider it would appear as if the gaming industry had actually grown up. Proving that the games industry has indeed changed and grown up is absolutely paramount to them being able to sell lawmakers, investors, and schools on buying and using educational games as a primary tool. Some people have asked though, what proof do you have that changing the public's perception of what gaming is is key to selling lawmakers and investors on the gamification of education? Well, the proof is actually self-evident because the lobbying efforts for gamified education hadn't worked at all until that point. They had totally and utterly failed. The Brookings Institution realized that the only way to change the minds of the lawmakers would be to change their perception of gaming altogether. And of course, all of this still holds true today. And they've been working on this for a long time. They had Diger founded in 2003. 
But without seeing the tides changing in lawmakers' minds, the venture capitalists tend to be extra cautionary to stay away altogether because it's just too risky. So changing the public's perception of what gaming is all about and who it caters to is indeed vitally important for pushing the gamification agenda. And you have to remember, most of these lawmakers are completely out of touch with gaming or even with technology in general. So to them, what gaming is, is defined by what the media tells them. Our lawmakers tend to be just as mindless as your average dupe. In fact, most, if not all, are just useful idiots who politically zoeed their way into political power. But what happened to this genius plan to herald the Ouya as the new era in gaming where they could claim that gaming had grown up and convince these suckers to put their indoctrination crap where in schools as the primary source of education? Well, unfortunately for them, the Ouya was an astounding market failure, even though it had 23.5 in combined crowdfunding and venture capital. And I guess it turns out people don't really want a shit console with an outdated garbage mobile processor, no games, and a crappy controller even if it only costs a hundred bucks. Hmm, who'd have thunk? Just look at these articles from a couple days ago. <laughs> yeah, if they don't find a buyer quick, they're totally kaput, as their debt restructuring had failed. But they knew it was curtains for Ouya quite a while ago. Once they knew that Ouya was a total unsalvageable failure, the Brookings boys switched to plan B, killing gamers, or at least, killing the perception that hardcore gamers were the main focus of the industry. That's when the command went out for the gamers are dead articles, as it was their only choice left if they wanted to change the public's perception of gaming. As a recap, as a fellow digger on 8chan wrote, when it was clear that Ouya was bust, Martin Orland got more money out of Gates in exchange for using his son's mailing list to shake up the video games industry, taking advantage of the still hot burgers and fries fiasco while the opportunity was there. Killing gamers was plan B, the industry's solution for delivering pro-social messages through indie games, Ouya, had failed. But now I want to take some time to elucidate on a topic from the last video. As was shown, the Brookings Institution admitted to fabricating the H-1B and computer sciences crisis in order to further Gates' agenda, but some don't believe that that's evidence that they would use the same tactics to push a different agenda. Well, let's analyze this train of thinking. First of all, Bill Gates is known to have invested over $5 billion in pushing Common Core over the years. What he's invested in H-1B reform is nothing compared to that. Common Core is essentially Gates' child, his baby, his most precious life's work, and H-1B reform is just nothing but his stepchild. Do you actually believe that someone would use subversive and nefarious tactics for something that's not extremely personal and important to them, and then decline to use said tactics on their fucking life's work, in which they have invested over $5 billion? It's pretty obvious to anyone with the brain that one would be far more likely to approve the subversive tactics for his true obsession. So it's actually extremely strong circumstantial evidence when you really think about it. In a trial, this evidence would be admissible. Also, some people are claiming that I didn't directly tie Gates to the Brookings Institute. It's not some secret. So let's look at the Brookings Institution's annual report. What do you know? Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is their top contributor. And finally, for those thinking, Bill Gates can't be evil, you know, with all the charities doing and whatnot, well, let's look at what this H-1B agenda he's pushing is actually about. It's about getting more and more Americans into the tech industry on top of making it way easier for tech companies to import foreign workers to come play. The real purpose is to create a surplus of tech workers in the labor pool so that the salaries get cut drastically. It's that old supply versus demand thing at work here. But what good person would want to lower the wages of tech slaves who work their asses off just so that he and his friends can be greedy? Yeah, like I said, he ain't no angel. So in the next episode, I'll go over why exactly gamification of education is so important to these guys. And of course, more connections, more mayhem. The fire's out of my neck now. This rabbit hole is a fucking Mobius loop at this point, and the train has reached escape velocity. Maybe I could find my sides out there. So subscribe, stay tuned, spread this shit like herpes. And if you want to help us digging with all these major breakthroughs, come and kick it on Gamergate HQ on 8chan. At least come and say hi to Bill's goons. Oh yeah, one more thing. Poll is always right.